Good morning. Good to be with you. I appreciate so much this congregation and this opportunity to get to study with you this week. We're looking forward to being with you. So many good people here, and I sure appreciate your stand for the truth, your love for that which is right, how light you've been in this community. You've been a big encouragement to me, and I just want you to know I'm delighted to be with you. Always good to be with brethren here. Appreciate so much the invitation. If you take your Bible and turn with me to 1 Peter for our class period, I'd like to talk to us about some precious things. It's interesting when you take a certain word and study from the different books of God's divine revelation, you'll find sometimes an author will repeat a word. You can go to the Roman letter and you'll find that the Apostle Paul uses the word heart over and over. He talks about their foolish heart in chapter 1 and he talks about their impenitent heart in chapter 2. And one time I did a series of about seven lessons where Paul talked about the heart in the Roman letter and he talks about it more than seven times, but you can just go through and talk about how God looks at the heart of man. But when you come to Peter's epistles, you'll find that Peter uses a word that should grab our attention. And it really identifies to us something that is precious. And if you take your Bible in 1 Peter and the second chapter, notice with me what the writer of God had to say in verse 4 beginning. He says, Coming to him as to a living stone, rejected indeed by men, but chosen by God, and watch it, and precious. You also, as living stones, are being built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Therefore, it is also contained in the Scripture, Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious, and he who believes on him will by no means be put to shame, Therefore, to you who believe, he is precious, but to those who are disobedient, the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. They stumble, being disobedient to the word, to which they also were appointed. Now then, Notice, if you will, when Peter is writing in 1 Peter 2, the phrase precious, and notice it's mentioned right there in verse 4, it's mentioned again in verse 6, and it's mentioned again in verse 7. Now, who is he talking about in 1 Peter 2? He's talking about the Christ, is he not? And notice he said that Christ is precious. When you think about the reason Christ is precious, the first thing we need to understand is He is precious to God. When I talk about being precious, that means of great value. That means something of infinite worth. Many times we think about precious stones or we think of something that's man-made as being precious, but in the uh, Scripture, the identity here is something of more value than that. Open your Bible to the book of John and the third chapter. And when you think about Jesus being precious, I want you to first understand He's precious to God the Father. In John chapter 3, Jesus is talking to Nicodemus. And look at what Jesus had to say in verse 16. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever believes in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God did not send His Son in the world to condemn the world, but that through the world, excuse me, but that the world through him might be saved. Now, when I think about Jesus Christ, I recognize he's precious to God. What is he? He's his only begotten son. Now, you and I are adopted into the family and we can become sons and daughters of God. But Jesus is the only begotten. He left the glory of heaven and he came to earth. You know what that shows you and me? You ever thought about how God values your soul? That He would send His Son, that which is most precious to Him, to die, to take away our sin. Today I hear people look at sin and they make a mockery of sin. I'll tell you what the problem is. The reason people laugh at sin and have a wrong view of sin is they have a wrong view of God. They don't see God as holy. I hear some people today with all that's going on with the Supreme Court ruling about homosexual marriage and all this, they're saying, well, God is love and, and God wants you to be happy. I'll tell you what God wants us is to be holy. 
Happiness is happenstance. It's what goes on. Joy is contentment because I'm right with God. And what God has called you and what God has called me to is holiness. Look, if you will, back in the Hebrew letter in the 11th chapter. When you look in the Hebrew letter and the 11th chapter. Now, if God called us to happiness, then I ask people to explain verse 35 uh, beginning. Look at what it says. Women received their dead, raised to life again. Others were tortured, not accepting deliverance that they may obtain a better resurrection. Still others had trial of mockings and scourgings, yes, and of chains and imprisonments. They were stoned, they were sawn in two, were tempted, were slain with the sword, were wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and mountains and dens and caves of the earth. Now, does that sound like God was just wanting their happiness here? It sounds like God was demanding their holiness. Life here is something that Paul, Peter, the writers talked about as were pilgrims, aliens passing through. That this world is not our home. But notice what they said in verse 39. And all these have attained a good testimony through faith, did not receive the promise, God having provided something better for us, that they should not be made perfect apart from us. That is the life beyond. So when I look at what Christ did for me, I recognize Christ is precious. He's precious in the eyes of God, but He should be precious in my eyes to the point that I put Him above all others. Anytime I put family, I put brethren, I put man, I put anything in the place of Christ, I say that it's more precious than He is. I'm 100% wrong. So when Peter is writing, he says, look, you are precious to God. But the reason you're precious is He's given you a soul. But notice he said, not only are you precious, He gave His precious Son to redeem you from your sin. And notice what it says about that. Look again in verse 6. He said He's a chief cornerstone. Now, He is what you build your life on. Now, I was talking to Brother Art. Uh, yesterday I had to watch the boys. I wish I could have come and helped uh, this in the morning, but we'd had just closed on a house, and I was watching the boys, and Daddy had come down. We got a, some locks to put on an, our new house. And you know what I'm not? I'm not a good carpenter. I, I can't get two pieces of wood to stay together very long. I sit there and, you know, just not my cup of tea. But I do know this much. If you're going to build a house, you want to put it on a solid foundation. My house in White Bluff, uh, we had problems with it, and I had to get it repaired. The foundation went bad. I started to buy a house in Shevel, same thing, cracks in the foundation. You don't want to build on a cracked foundation. I'll tell you what will happen. The house will start to crumble. Now, I'm not very smart, but even I know that much. Well, what do you want to build your life on? Remember, Jesus taught that in Matthew 7. What did Jesus say? You don't build your house on the sand. What does sand do? Sand shifts, sand moves. The house will collapse. You build it on solid rock. Well, look at what Peter says. Peter says you build your life on Christ. He said he's the chief cornerstone. The cornerstone is that, uh, uh, that brings the house together, the foundation. And notice, he says in verse 7, Therefore to you who believe, He is precious. Why? I'm building my life. Now, I may talk more about that this week, but I want you to think about it. He has become the chief cornerstone. But look what He is to the pre person who disobe is disobedient. He's a stone of stumbling, a rock of offense. They stumble being disobedient to the word to which they were appointed. So he's a precious to the saints because what they receive from him. But he's a stumbling block to the world because they reject his teaching. Do you see that? Think about that. Do you not see that with the world? You know, a lot of people today woke up this morning just like you and I did, but instead of thanking God that they awoke, they just got up, and they went, and they didn't think one more thing about God. And they're going to spend today as any other day. They're not going to worship God. They're not going to be obedient to God. They're not going to give God. And what they're doing is they're rejecting the cornerstone. And look at what he says there. The, the stones which the builders rejected. They're very, the, some people are religious and who should know who Christ is, but what do they do? They're disobedient to the Word. 
There are people today that got up, but they are not following Christ according to His pattern. They're not obeying God. They're not uh, worshiping in spirit and truth. They're worshiping the way they want instead of the way God has told us. And you know what that is? That's saying that Christ is not precious. If Christ is the cornerstone, the foundation, we build upon what He says. Look in your Bible to the Ephesian letter for just a moment. And when you come to the Ephesian letter, notice with me what the Apostle Paul had to say. In Ephesians 1, look at verse 22. And he put all things under his feet and gave him to be head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all and in all. Now look at that. He's to be the what? head. And what are we? What's the church? The body. Now, what does the body do? That's right. That's exactly right. Now, our bodies listens to what? Our head, right? The head tells the body what to do. If the body tells the head what to do, guess what? you got troubles. The head's supposed to direct the body. Well, if Christ is the head and we're the body, what do we do? We do what the head tells us to do. But the problem is, is when the body overthrows the head. And that's what you have with people today. They don't want to obey Christ. They don't want to worship the way He's told us to worship. They say, we know better. And what they ignore what the head has said. And sometimes man doesn't like the position of being the body. What's he want to be? The head. That's right. That's exact. He has all authority, doesn't he? And the one who has authority tells us what to do. And if you go against that authority, that's rebellion. And so here God has told man how to worship. God has told man how to live. God has given man everything he needs uh, to be right. And man rebels. And that's exactly the problem. You ever notice uh, if you have two heads, what do you have? A monster. <laughs> you ever seen? You, that's what you have. We're not to be the head. The Pope's not the head. No preacher's the head. Christ is the head. The church, the collective body, that's the body. And so the collective people. So when I look in 1 Peter 2, I recognize Christ is precious. And I need to believe and show how precious He is. If I believe He's precious, I'm going to follow His Word. Now the question I have, and I want to ask, is He precious to you? Do you build your life on what He says? Because I'll tell you, this world will do whatever it can to take us away. You ever notice how the Bible describes the preciousness of Christ? In John 6, He's identified as the living bread. In John 4, He's the living water. He's the sustainer of our spiritual life. Bread and water. He's what we need. He's precious. Okay? So that's the first thing. Now, if you take your Bible, look again in 2 Peter uh, chapter 1. In 2 Peter chapter 1, uh, look at what he says in verse 2. So not only is Christ precious, but Peter wants us to understand something else that has great value. And that is, uh, in verse 2, to those who have obtained like precious faith. So not only is Christ precious, but faith is precious. Now when I originally deliver these, I did it a series of five lessons, but I'm not going to have time to get into all that, but I want you to think about why faith is precious. What is faith based on? God's Word. Uh, in Romans chapter 10 and verse 17, what does he say? Faith comes by what? Hearing. And hearing by what? The Word of God. The only way I'm going to get faith is by studying the Word of God. I'm not going to get it any other way. Now, I can look out and see God's creation. I can uh, talk. But the only way I really grow my faith is knowing what God has said. And that's what he's... Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. So, faith is precious because it's pre based upon the precious Word. Look in Matthew chapter 7. In Matthew 7, when uh, Jesus was speaking in the Sermon on the Mount, uh, look at the statement that He makes. It shows us where the Word, why it's so precious. Uh, in Matthew chapter 7, Jesus is talking about build upon the Word. And notice how the people responded. And verse 28, 
When Jesus had ended these sayings, they, the people were astonished, for He taught them as one having what? Authority. That's what we just talked about. Christ is precious because He's the head of the church. And also, he's, we build our life upon what He said that takes faith. Our faith is precious because we have a faith built upon Jesus Christ and His Word. Okay, So in verse 7, look at what he says in, back in 2 Peter. Uh, he talks about brotherly kindness and brotherly kindness love. You think about uh, 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 brotherly kindness at this time meant a lot because you have both Jew and Gentile coming to Christ, both having this faith. They've obtained a like precious faith both Jew and Gentile, and they shared this brotherly love. So faith is precious because it's based on God's Word. It's precious because of its object. Who's our faith in? Christ. It's God's only begotten. But faith is precious also because of its benefits. What does faith do? Can you name me three things? Name me three things Shane will buy you a steak dinner. I don't got nothing to lose. <laughs> what, does, what does it do? Can you tell me what does faith do? What are some benefits of faith? Sure, sure. Yeah, it, it do, definitely does that. It, 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 if, and we'll talk more about that, uh, about the trials in, in just a moment back in 1 Peter 1. Uh, I'll count that one so you get a steak dinner. Uh, Shane. Uh, now, the first thing I want you to think about, it, so the second thing here is faith justifies. Look back in the Roman letter. That's right. That's right. You're putting your faith in Christ and not man. That's exactly right. And notice what he says. You're right. And our faith is in God. It's in His Word. So our faith grows. And then look at what he says in Romans 5.1. Therefore, having been what? Romans 5.1. Justified by faith. What does it mean to be justified? Does anybody know? That, that, yeah, that's right. Justification is is God, when I come to God on His terms in obedience, I've obeyed God, God removes the sin. I'm justified. That is a legal term. If you go to court and, uh, and you're justified, it doesn't mean you're innocent. It means that the record has been expunged. You know, you and I aren't innocent of sin. We've all sinned, haven't we? But what we have is faith in Christ, and it's our faith in Christ that takes away the record. It's just as if I didn't sin, because my record has been expunged. He takes care of it. So justification is in that. Look back in Romans 5, look at verse 8. Notice the thought Paul continues there. In Romans 5, he says, But God demonstrated His own love toward us, and while we were still sinners, Christ died for us much more than now having been justified not only by his faith, by faith, but by what? His blood. That's where our faith is. Is in the power of God to take away our sin. So faith justifies. Now, look, if you will, in the book of John in the 17th chapter, and you'll see a second benefit of faith. Faith in God's Word is what moves us to act. If I don't have faith, I'll never be baptized. If I'm baptized without faith, all I've done is taken a bath. Faith is God's Word causes me to act. I understand what God has said, and I now, when I act, I've been justified. God takes away my sins. All I've done is obey God. I don't have the power to take away my sin. God does it. So God's the one that saves me. I come to God on His terms. God saves me. Then in John 17, I notice the second blessing is God sanctifies. Look at verse 17. If God, I put my faith in God's Word, look at what He says. Sanctify them by your truth. Your Word is truth. What does it mean to be sanctified? Set apart. That's exactly right. That doesn't mean that I, 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 I still live in the world, but I'm not of the world. I don't do what the world does. I don't follow in the uh, sinfulness and the uh, decadence of the world because I have been set apart to do the will of God. And you see that picture taken throughout the New Testament. Look in Acts chapter 15. Uh, Acts 15, you'll see where there's a picture of sanctification, being set apart. 
look in verse 9. Uh, you, in Acts 15, he talked about the Jew and Gentile. And notice that he says, He made no distinction between us and them, Jew and Gentile, purifying their hearts by what? Faith. Faith. Their hearts have been purified. They've been sanctified. They've been set apart. Both Jew and Gentile that have what? Faith in Christ. So it doesn't matter your background. It doesn't matter where you're from. It doesn't matter what your forefathers did. An individual comes to faith in Christ. They, they understand what Christ has done. They believe and trust the promises of God and His Word. Then they are justified and they are sanctified. Now, look in your will. Uh, uh, well, I'm going to skip that part. Look, if you will, uh, at a third blessing. Look in Galatians chapter 3. Uh, in Galatians chapter 3. Now, faith is precious because of the Word it's based upon. It's precious because of who it's in, and it's precious because of its benefits. And we've so far seen faith justifies, faith sanctifies, but notice what else faith does. Faith adds us. Faith adopts us. You become children of God. Look in Galatians chapter 3. Look at verse 26. For you are all sons of God through what? Faith in Christ Jesus. Now look at the very next verse. Some people who say faith only don't want to look at the next verse. What's the next verse say? For as many of you were baptized into Christ. You ever notice faith and obedience go hand in hand? The Greek word there, and I'm not getting into all the Greek, but the original word is action. When we talk about faith, you do something. Hebrews 11, by faith, Abraham left his home country. By faith, Noah built the ark. You ever notice? It's action. Faith doesn't mean I just believe and don't do anything. Faith means I respond to what I say I believe. And so here, you are sons of God through faith, for as many of you as were baptized have put on Christ. Do you see the faith? You become added to the family of God. And notice what you become. If you are Christ, you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. You know, if you're adopted, you know what that means? You automatically are part of the family. You are added to God's family. You're an heir. And that's what he says here in verse 29. You're an heir to Abraham's seed. He's talking about heaven. So you have the benefits. Now, I want you to think of another reason faith is precious. Faith is precious because it's rare. You ever notice so few have it? A lot of people want Christianity at their convenience, but they don't want faith that puts their trust in God to the point where they lose this world. A lot of people live their life with a little bit of hope in heaven, a little bit of religion, but they want to hold on to the world. And you ever notice if you try to live that way, you're miserable. If you try to hold on to the world, you're going to be miserable. And that's where a lot of people are. It, there's a lot of things here that are shiny and bright and distracting, and we look around and we start, ooh, I want that. And we take our eyes off what is really precious. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. Everything he's told us are things that, that we, we can do. And everything, and, and, and so what we do is put our faith in what he has said. And, and think about how few all through every generation have been saved. How many were saved in the days of Noah? Eight. Remember Matthew 7 when Jesus talked about the straight way, the narrow way, and the broad way? How many is he say going to find the narrow way? Few. Few be there. That, why? It's not easy. It's not easy. It, it takes self-sacrifice. But then I'll tell you why faith is precious. One more reason. The influence it has on others. You ever thought about when we let our light shine? What it can be. You know, it gets discouraging. You, I'm sure here at Antioch, like other places I've been, we remember a day when you had a gospel meeting, the place was full, and you could... Oh, I remember my grandmother uh, grew up over here in Cheatham County. She said that when they had a gospel meeting, they'd raise the windows and people would stand outside and listen through the window. And uh, she said, you try to find a seat by the boy you like so you could talk to him between the lessons, you know. And, uh, and, that, and we think, what's happened? Well, the world's happened. 
and their influence of people and we have come further and further away from God. You have so many distractions and people become so distracted and what I need to do is instead of cursing the darkness, what do I need to do? I need to be a light in the darkness and I can be an influence. Look in Philippians chapter 2. Uh, look at what Paul said. In Philippians chapter 2, look what he says in verse 15. Here's what we're to be. Verse 14 and 15. Do all things without complaining and disputing. Boy, couldn't we learn that lesson. That you may become blameless and harmless children of God without fault in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation among whom you shine as lights in the world. You know what I think is going to happen, and I could be 100% wrong, and it wouldn't be the first time today. But with all that's going on in this country, and all the things that are happening where immorality is being uh, shoved down people's throats, you can't watch a television program, it's not on there. You can't. Some people are going to get tired of it. And they're going to start looking for light. Because you can only stumble in the darkness for so long before you start wondering, where is this going to end up? And you know what? You and I can be, we can be lights. In this community, where we work, where we, we can be lights. I think you all are. And I think you, you're a light in this community. And we need to remember, we're here because we love God and we want to be a light. So faith is precious. So not only do you have the precious Christ, you have precious faith. Uh, but now then, and there was a few others, you could look at how... Uh, the preciousness of uh, how faith helps us in the home. But look, if you will, uh, back in First Peter chapter 1. In First Peter chapter 1, look at verse 7. Now, verse 7 might shock you. We can understand why Christ is precious, and we can understand why faith is precious. But notice Peter talks about, in verse 7, the genuineness of your faith being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. He talks about precious trials. But notice why trials are precious. He says it's going to test your what? Faith. And we're going to talk more about that this morning in our lesson. But notice, he talks about here are people that their faith is being put on trial. And notice he says you will be tried. The genuineness of your faith is going to be tried. Now, why is that important for us to understand what does faith, why, why is testing important to our faith? What does it do? That's exactly right. And what it does is it sees if something is sincere, doesn't it? We're testing. You ever thought about uh, uh, all through Scripture, God's people, were they not going through tests and trials? And what was it to see if their faith was genuine? And so here, we have to go through trials. And we're going to be tested. And notice, he says, uh, persecution will come. Yeah, One passage that always bothered me. You ever thought about what Paul told Timothy? He said, all who live godly in Christ Jesus will what? Suffer persecution. Notice that, will. You ever notice, everywhere Paul went, they wanted to kill him. Everywhere I go, they want to give me sweet tea. And sometimes I wonder if the problem is, we're not preaching it like we should. And here we live in a day where our faith is going to be put to the test. You don't think we're going to be put to the test? With all the laws that are changing and all the corruption that's going on, I want to tell you something. Many of you grew up in the days of Joshua when everyone was wanting to serve the Lord. Some of those who are younger growing up in the days of Judges where everybody's doing that which is right in their own eyes. And we're going to have to make sure our faith is secure. And it's going to be put to the test. Uh, I tell you, there's been times when mine's been put to the test and I didn't stand like I should. You know what that made me realize? I need to build it stronger. Haven't you ever been there? Haven't you ever been there and thought, oh, why did I do that? Why didn't I? And the next thing I need to remember is that when it's put to the test, it's an opportunity to show where my faith is. If my faith is in what my brethren think of me, I've already lost the battle. It needs to be in what does God want from us. 
All right, now look, if you will, First Peter 1, 19. And we'll, we'll go by about three or four more minutes. How long do y'all normally go? Okay. Well, I might go that long. <laughs> uh, look at what he says in verse 19. But with the precious blood of Christ as a lamb without blemish and without spot. Now, look at that word precious revealing something of great value. And this time, he's talking about the blood of Christ. You can go through the Old Testament and see the the value of blood. They had to shed the blood of the animals to uh, 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 make the animal sacrifices. But when you come to the New Testament, notice we are under the blood of Christ. And why is that important? Why is it important for us to be under the blood of Christ? That's right. That's right. Look in Hebrews 10. Look in Hebrews 10 for four. Look at what, what the Hebrew writer said. He said, it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats could take away sin. So they follow God's word and God removed the sin, but ultimately who takes away sin? Christ. So that was being rolled forward or it was being taken care of. Now, look at what he says in verse 10. But that will, excuse me, by that will we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. So it's through the blood of Christ, what? Sins are blotted out. It's precious blood. You think about how precious that is. It's, it's the blood of a human who was also God. And it was the blood of an innocent person. And so Christ's blood is precious because it gives us atonement of sin. Remember what he said in Romans 5, you're justified by His blood. We're reconciled to God, Romans 5.10. We're purchased. You know what the church is? It's people who've been purchased by the blood of Christ, Acts 20.28. 20, you and I have nothing to boast about. We're just purchased people. He died, He shed His blood. And so we need to see the value of the blood of Christ. We need to see the power of His blood and we need to see how serious sin is. Sin is so serious, the only thing that can take it away is the blood of Christ. Now I think we've missed that sometimes. So now then I see the Christ is precious. I see faith is precious. I see trials is precious. I see the blood is precious. But I want you to look at one more. And then we'll we'll call it a, um, our lesson. Look back, if you will, and notice in in Second Peter chapter one, verse four. Second Peter chapter one and verse four. By which have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises, that through these you may be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Now. Look at the last thing. Precious promises. Now, they're precious because first, they're divine. They come from God. You ever notice man can make a promise and not keep it? God keeps every promise He makes. And, and you know, it says in Titus that God cannot lie. So God is one who's going to be true to His promise. And so people need to see that God is true. And then, notice that second line. You're partakers of the divine nature, of His nature. We're born again. We're part of His family. People need to be able to see His likeness in us. But then, notice what else He says there, that we might escape the corruption. That is where? We've been talking about it all morning. In the world. So this corruption is removed. And that's because we've been conformed to the image of Christ. Now, because of that, look at the blessing we have. Forgiveness of sins promise of guidance and promise of help. You ever thought about that God's note doesn't leave us alone down here? You ever thought about the value of prayer? When you pray to God, you know who's all in there? Look in the Roman letter for just a moment. Next time you pray, I want you to recognize that when you petition the God of heaven in prayer, you have all three members of the Godhead active. In Romans chapter 8, Paul talks about three times for us. He talks about the Holy Spirit uh, in verse 26. Likewise, the Spirit also helps in our weaknesses, for we do not know what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit Himself makes intercession for us. Now, I have that underscore. With groanings which cannot be uttered. Then, if you look in your Bible, look at verse uh, 34. Who is he who condemns? Is it Christ who died and furthermore is also risen? Who is even at the right hand of God who also, look at that word, also makes intercession for us? Now, 
verse 31, if God is for us, who can be against us? You have God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. When I pray to the Father, the Spirit and Christ make intercession for me. Now, when I think about all three members of the Godhead, active, Christ is the mediator, 1 Timothy 2, 15. He's also an intercessor. You have the Holy Spirit making intercession on our behalf uh, with, with groanings. And it says He is on our side going to the Father. You have all three members of the Godhead. You ever thought about how powerful prayer is? And here when I pray to God, I can ask God for help. And you know what God has said He'll do? He doesn't say He'll remove my trials. I need those trials, don't I, to build my faith. So I know he's not going to remove every trial, but what is he going to do? He says, I'll be with you. He doesn't give us more than we can bear. He sustains us. His grace gives us the power to endure. Have you ever been at a point in life you felt overwhelmed? I have. There's been points in my life where I looked around and, and it just seemed like everything was crumbling. Um, I remember in 2009, uh, after Brother Jackson died, my mother died. My son was diagnosed with cystic fibrosis. We'd had financial trouble. I just thought it was all collapsing. And you know what I, the one thing I learned about that? God stays with you. I remember sometimes you pray and you just don't feel like you can say the words and you just have to say, Lord, look at my heart. And you know what I know? He knows my heart. And I'll tell you something. When I think about that promise that He'll be with me no matter what, that is what builds my faith. I've been preaching places and I've had people say, Brother Richardson, we'll be behind you as long as you preach the truth. And when I look behind me, they're way behind me. <laughs> They've left me. <laughs> I, I've, had them, I've had them come up threatening to hit me. I've had them threaten. And I've looked around to see who was going to be with me. And they, the ones I thought be there weren't there. But I know who was. And what I do is I have to defend the truth because I love the Lord. If I do it for any other reason, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll bow under pressure. But if I love the Lord with all my heart, soul, and strength, and I love Him because He first loved me and sent His most precious Son to die for me, then I'll tell you what. I won't have any problem living for Him because I want to live with Him. Isn't that what we're up for? You ever get discouraged? Sometimes you might think, well, why aren't... You know, you remember this. Live for Him. Live for Him. And one day you'll live with Him. And your faith just might influence others to live for Him. I thank you for studying with me this morning. And I look forward to the rest of the meeting with you. If you have any major questions, ask Shane. He said, told me the other day he was a scholar and he'd be glad to answer any deep theological questions. So, I'm good.